right now. We are all being recorded now. All right. So everybody, welcome Brent Barron. Um, she's a teacher, a pastor, a public speaker, and author of the new book, Worth It. Worth it. Overcoming your fears and embracing the life you were made for. Um, her book tells her story of growing up in a super white co uh, Colorado suburb in the evangelical megachurch world and uh, has taken her all the way to, um, well, now to Austin, first to Southern California, now to Austin with a wife and a dog and a bunch of plants who I hope made the journey all safe. They made it. They made it. It was, it was intense, but they did it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess my first question, before I turn it over to you, I, I guess my first question is, um, are you planning on starting a new church where you are now? Yeah, I, well, so this, I just celebrated uh, before we moved, that was my 10th year of, of being in that, that world, that role one way or another. And so yeah. it felt like a good moment to pause and take a little break and sort of assess yeah. and see what's next. So right now I'm, I'm just uh, taking some space and time to, to see what's next. So we'll see. I, it feels hard to stay away, but trying to, trying to get some space right now. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'll turn it over to you. I don't know if you wanted to read or if you wanted to just talk about your book or whatever, whatever you want to do. Can yeah, I mean, I could, I'll, yeah, I'll read maybe just a few of my favorite parts. We can do questions. We can do anything you want. You know what I mean? This is, this is your Zoom world. I'm just here. Um, I think like weirdly, one of my favorite, I shouldn't say weirdly, um, because I don't know what's normal for book writing because this is my first book. So maybe everyone's favorite part is the introduction, but that's um, actually my favorite um, part of the book. So i um, just going to read a little bit from the introduction, um, if that is all right. Um, so this is about, uh, I'm standing at, at my wedding. So good friend Brian. Uh, who you'll hear more about in this book, was one of Sammy's bridesmen. Uh, Sammy's my wife. We all went to the same Christian college, and Brian actually came out a few years before us. If you ask anyone at our wedding what stood out to them, what they remember from the ceremony, they might talk about our vows or the music, but after they give you the obligatory, the girls look beautiful, they'll probably mention how hard Brian cried. Brian was truly a mess in the best way possible. And because all of Sammy's people were standing behind her and I was facing toward her, every now and then out of the corner of my eye, I could see his shoulders shaking uncontrollably. Um, we all have joked many, many times how hard he was crying, and I was definitely crying too. In fact, so many people were crying during our ceremony. And while I want to imagine they were crying because the sheer magnitude of my physical beauty was too much to handle, <laughs> I think they were crying for reasons that are even more meaningful. A few weeks ago, I finally asked Brian why he was crying so hard at our wedding. In the past, he had told us because it was his first gay wedding. This time, we were having a drink, and he gave us an answer that brought me to tears again. Not only did Brian, Sammy, and I go to the same Christian college, but we all ended up at the same church after college. I was a pastor, Sammy worked in the creative department, and Brian attended. The church was only eight miles from the college we went to, so every Sunday felt like a bit of a reunion with so many people from all areas of our lives coming together. But our college and church held something in common. They were not places where it was okay to be gay. You couldn't work at either institution if you were gay, of course, but it went a little beyond that. Every person who called these places home was assumed and required to have a view of the world and God that was not inclusive of people who were gay. On May 13th, when we stood in front of 250 of our closest friends, Many in the audience had called these places home. So here's what brought Brian to tears. Our wedding was at 5 p.m., meaning the sun was shining perfectly on us, but really beating down on the crowd. And Brian told us that as he looked out, he saw all those people from our church and our small Christian college putting their hands on their foreheads, leaning in, trying to block the sun from their eyes so they could see our wedding better. He really began to cry, he told us, when he realized that for years, many of those same people use those same hands to cover their eyes 
not wanting to see or celebrate the lives of queer people. And now they were using their hands to try to get a better view of two women getting married. That's what evolution looks like. That's what change and growth look like. And that is what is possible when we run head on into what scares us. Our choice to embrace freedom over fear will impact not only our lives, but so many lives around us. That's, That's so poetic, the way he said that. I was so remarkable in the book when he said that, you know, years before they'd all been covering their eyes and now everybody was trying to see. I know. When he said that, I was just like, what? <laughs> oh my gosh. We were like at a wedding in Mexico having a drink. And I was like, Brian, that is... That's beautiful. Why don't you tell me sooner? What yeah. um what was the initial uh, reason that you wanted to write the book? What was the the thing that really put you over the line to thinking like, all right, I'm gonna write a book about this experience? Yeah, well, I'm one of those people who's like wanted to write a book since you were like since I was little, you know, yeah. um, and but like never really had anything to say <laughs> uh, or I'm sure I did, but I wasn't, you know, uh, in touch with it. And sort of went through that whole experience and it felt very like insular. It felt like a very isolated experience. Like how many closeted mega church pastors are there? I mean, maybe probably more than I think, but um, I think when, when I decided to write the book is when I started getting messages from people and having conversations with people, who were having like similar experiences in, in vastly different areas. So people who were getting divorced or choose to leave their job to start their own business or do these things. Um, and I realized, oh, like the universal truth in there is like, we have to outgrow the expectations that people have put on us to do the things that we really want. Um, and once it felt more, more big, um, then I was like, oh, this is what I want to write about. Mm -hmm. How many years was it after you came out that you started writing the book? Uh, four. So yeah. good, good amount of time for yeah. thinking and like therapy. Yeah. <laughs> getting back to normal. Um, so for people who haven't read the book, um, I'd love it if you talk a little bit about your childhood that you talk about in the book and what it was like growing up in the church and, I was really interested in your, you know, description of being in your early 20s um, and how certain you were about all the things, because I think I was also that kind of an early 20-year. I might, yeah, yeah. I really thought I knew what I was talking about. I thought I knew everything. I was like, wow, I have arrived. I'm 22 and I know it all. <laughs> Isn't that amazing for me? Um, but yeah, I grew, so I grew up in, in the church, deep in the evangelical church. My dad was, uh, worked for a ministry and then became a pastor. Um, so really in it. And I decided to go to a small Christian college just to double down on what I already thought was true, just to confirm it was. And um, yeah, I like sophomore year of college, junior year of college, I just remember thinking, oh, it feels so good to know everything. It feels so good to have an answer for everything. Like I knew how the world worked. I was like, these are the things I should do. And then my life will be good. If I do these things, my life will be hard. Um, and I just had such certitude about God and the world and my role in it. And I mean, to a fault for sure, but it was comforting, right? Which, which is what I, you know, write about in the book. I think what, that's what keeps folks in that place, even though they may have ideologically outgrown those thoughts or, or they haven't proven to be true, but it is comforting to feel like, you know, everything, even though you, <laughs> you know, you may not, um, it felt nice. Um, and of, of course, until it, it didn't, but yeah, it was, it was a setup for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can. I mean, I feel like that's a lot of the reason that people like to stay in their bubbles is that it is really more comfortable there, you know, and I noticed on your website and through following you on social media that um, 
your work has changed a little bit this summer with the intensification of like the Black Lives Matter movement. And I'm curious about what you're doing now and how that has changed the way or what audiences you're speaking to now and um, what people are having you come and, and talk about anti-racism work. Yeah. So anti-racism work is something I got into um, around the same time in college, uh, actually leading up to um, Barack Obama announcing his run for president the first time. Remember that? And, um, <laughs> oh man. And, um, and, and, and getting involved in that and sort of hearing the conversations. Um, and so it, it's always been sort of a part of my life and things that I do. And, and what's interesting is I had sort of uh, taken a break for it. I, I worked um, for a while, I, I started uh, something called a civil rights tour where I would take folks, put people in a van, like 12 people, we'd fly down to Little Rock, we'd get in that van and we would uh, retrace the, the uh, Freedom Riders. Um, we would interview people and visit historic sites um, and was really involved in that work. And as you know, you might, know or, or assume it became very overwhelming emotionally to um to be doing that and, and to go be going through that and to have those conversations and so i took a little step back from it um and that's when i was like okay and i come out and all these things and i was like let me let me take a, a a little break um and then this summer um as things started just I'm not gonna say picking up, but things certainly started gaining in their um, viewing, right? And then in the way that they were shared. I, um, I started getting like my in, I, had, I feel like I had gained this new audience through the book that wasn't necessarily like um, uh, inherently interested in, in anti-racism work. And so what was fascinating is that after George Floyd was murdered, my inbox was like flooded with people asking like, how do I, where do I even start? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I developed a course called Understanding Racism 101, and it was designed for just that, like, this is 101. If you, you haven't been, um, involved in this work, you, this is your entry point, because I realized, like, oh, there's so much good work out there, but you, like, you need to know a base amount to, like, sort of <laughs> appreciate. You have to have some kind of common language, um, and so that has been, yeah, quite a resurgence just for me personally of, of that's been, it's switched from talking about the book into like, let's do keynotes, let's do podcasts, let's do courses, like let's, um, my, my goal in that has been, how can I communicate this in a way that is accessible um, to someone who might be genuinely wanting to get into the conversation, maybe for the first time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And is that where you see um your work going in the near future or what's what's next for you are you gonna write another book yeah that's a good question <laughs> um I, I i am gonna write another like um nonfiction. um i'm it's a little i'm pushing i keep pushing it down the road um but i do want to uh a few things like probably a little bit sooner here i've been working on a children's book um which is really fun and uh, working on another course, um, this one for uh, like how to be an ally. So like Queer Allyship 101, uh, again, meant to be accessible and entry level for someone who's like, I don't understand pronouns or the difference between gender and sexuality. Um, just something for folks who feel like they're getting lost in the social dialogue, but actually want a, a place to jump into something meatier. Um, mm -hmm. Cause that's what we saw with the understanding racism. So those two things coming down sooner, I'm kicking the can down the road on another book because it's really hard, it really, to call yeah. out of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how long did it take you to write? Um, I wrote it pretty fast. Um, wrote it in about nine months. Um, well, I guess fast is relative, but um, I guess in the time, I guess it was like a baby. Wow, that was, <laughs> didn't expect that to just work out you like that. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I got on a pretty, like, I got on a pretty strict writing schedule, like 5, 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. Um, and then, you know, weekends off. And so uh, I don't, 
I don't necessarily, I kind of miss it because it's like, it was such a special time of like quiet mornings, but now I'm like, oh gosh, it's better when you sleep, when you just sleep instead. <laughs> um, so, so we'll see, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to keep, keep writing and keep putting content out there. Yeah. So I'd love to, I don't know if you have any other passages that you um, would like to read. I'm interested, I was really interested in the theme of like fear that goes mm -hmm. through your book because I think that that is such a strong driving force in, you know, driving people towards something, but also driving people away. And I didn't know if you had any passages uh, from the book that you wanted to read about that or anything else you wanted um, to say. Yeah. Do a little something on fear. Um, let me, I'll actually read the very, this is the very, the very, very end of my book. Oh, the beginning and the end. What a great, look at me. Um, this is a, a short passage, but I feel like um, can open up a, a bigger conversation about fear. Um, so my spiritual, my spiritual director once told me that fear lives in shallow breath. And I think they are completely right. I believe with my whole heart that one of the first things we can do to find freedom and our own healing is to not give fear a place to live. If you're looking for a place to start or on a long road and looking for some fuel, or even if you just don't know what to do, let me, offer you, let me offer you these simple words of wisdom as the great start to any new beginning. Breathe deeply. Fill your lungs with air only to feel them empty again. Remind yourself that this is all a part of this thing called being human. Deep breaths, fullness, and loss. Feel it all. Don't hold it in. Don't let shallow breaths give room and board to your fear. Breathe deeply and go straight into the life that is calling you no matter what it costs. Which, you know, I think that throughout the whole, how we ended up on the title and, and, and one of my favorite things about the book is I kept saying, I just want people to know that it's worth it, but it, it's never, it's not easy. Um, you just, you will be afraid and the things you're afraid of might happen. Um, and I didn't want to write a book that was like, hey, if you do the right thing, nothing will be hard. And um, the things you're afraid of probably, that's just, no, don't, don't even pay attention to that. They won't happen. It's like, no, they, they, they might. And, um, and it's going to be hard either way. Like, but, um, choosing to go through that is just always worth it, I believe. Uh, and so that looks like not, not giving fear the, the room that it needs to, to breathe and to, and to board. Yeah. That's great advice breathing yeah I, um, breathing yeah breathing <laughs> uh i was uh i've been a pretty serious practitioner of yoga for many for like 15 years and uh, uh have taught a lot and it's incredible how many people don't breathe deeply ever truly like, you know really mm -hmm. just on a physiological level just taking some deep breaths every day yeah it's such a special, I mean, it's obviously we're, we're all doing it, but it's, it's just such a special thing. And if you're aware of it, you're like, okay, this rhythm makes sense and I can, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to ask Brit anything? I'm kind of capitalizing on this conversation. <laughs> I saw Gail take a deep breath when you instructed everybody to do it. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, Gail. Thanks, Gail. <laughs> yeah. Good job, Gail. <laughs> Nobody else? What else you want to talk about, Britt? Um, I, uh, anything, I don't know. <laughs> what else, okay. what do people want to hear about Britt's story? I mean, I guess since uh, nobody else has read the book, they don't know as much about your story as I do. Hi, Debbie. Hi, I know, I decided to go ahead because I did have a question. Good. Oh, good, good. Um, first of all, I am thrilled that uh, we're that to have Britt with us. Um, I'm also with Indy Reads, and I'm just so happy that you're with us tonight. And I'm just going to ask you the old standard question I ask everybody: What readers influenced you? What did you love reading? 
what directed your path that way? What writers? What yeah. books? Um, oh, great question. Um, my favorite book of all time ever um, is the autobiography of Malcolm X as told to Alex Haley. Uh, I've read it. I've just keep reading it. I don't even know how many times I first I read it for the very, very first time when I was 16 years old. Um, and it felt like it truly felt like I had never read a book before. I was like, I was like, what is happening? I was so sad. Like, you know, that super specific sadness that comes when you're getting to the end of a book that you know for sure is going to change change your life so um that uh is is my favorite book um octavia butler has also been a, a huge influence one day in my life i want to write fiction um just still working up to it um and i don't know I, i'm right at the perfect age for harry potter that was like <laughs> not ashamed to say it like I was right like middle school when the first book dropped and I was like oh, what's gonna happen um yeah so I, I'd say those were three authors and and some books that really got me have you read um I know why the caged bird sings I have that's my favorite book of all time okay that's a good one uh, yeah. That left a mark on me, and uh, also their eyes were watching God. I was wondering if you were, yeah, I yeah. read that one, Zora. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's another man. Yeah, and Alice Walker. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've Those read most of her essays and not her novels. I I love her essays and poetry. Yeah, I'll stop I, talking now. It's not no. it's not my show. <laughs> no, I love that. I just um, so Roxane Gay. Um, it's someone I also love, and she did a comic book that I just found out about mm -hmm. called The Banks. Has anyone heard of it? It's like a mom and two daughters, uh, they're all black women, and they are like bank robbers. Uh -huh. And it's like getting turned into a movie, but I had never, so I just found out about it literally two days ago, and I'm assuming it's going to be my favorite comic book, but I haven't read it yet. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Well, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. No problem. Yeah. So maybe we should work. I feel like we're working in reverse. I like the first question I asked you is what are you doing next? And now I'm like, <laughs> talk about your story because it occurs to me that since probably maybe nobody else has read the book yet, um, they don't know what your whole story is. So maybe you could give the oh yeah version. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. So, um, well, part of my story, which I already said, is I grew up, you know, super uh, evangelical in the 90s, which was like a big, you know, height of that and um, was very unaware of my own um, sexuality for most of my life. And if you, I, I joke that like being closeted in the evangelical church was the best place because if I would say like, oh, I'm not even attracted to these guys. I'm not even tempted. And people are like, oh, good for you. And then I looking back, I was like, oh, <laughs> that made sense. Um, and so at, at 26, I got a job uh, as a pastor at a mega church, um, which was sort of like the peak, like what I had been working towards and working for. Um, and one, like two weeks after uh, I started working there. I got a message from uh, a girl who wanted to volunteer um, to be part of it. Her name was Sammy. And I just remember sitting at coffee with her like, what is happening to me? Like, what? Why, why am I like, what is it about this person? She's so awesome. She's so captivating. Like, I just, even still then was unaware, but I was like, you know, we, we talked for four hours. Um, and so we developed a quick friendship uh, that we then realized like, oh, this is more than that. Um, we want it to be more than that. We're, we're in love. Um, and that was the most beautiful and terrifying thing I've ever gone through in my whole life. Because while falling in love is amazing and wonderful and felt like breathing air for the first time, um, it also meant sort of this entire life that I had had built would 
um, no longer exist. And so um, it was certainly the first time in my life where I've dealt with that kind of like fear, um, which is why it's such a main theme of the book. And I spent way too long caught in this loop of, I don't know how to choose Sammy and not resent her for having to give up everything else that was true about my life. And I don't know how to pick those things and not resent them forever for having to give up Sammy. Um, and I sort of circled that loop for three years, um, which is too long, but it was. And, and she was right there with me. You know, there was questions in my head of like, is this bad? Am I going to go to hell or is this okay? Or was I wrong or are they wrong? This feels right. Um, and then once I sort of like realized, no, this is okay and it is good. Then the practical questions of, but I'll lose my job and where can I work? Um, being a mega church pastor truly has almost zero transferable skills. Like no one's like, Hey, do you want to run our tech company? You are a pastor. <laughs> um, so I just, you know, I just was stuck. Like I would, you know, go to therapy um, every week and just be like, I, I can't do anything. Like I'm just stuck. I'm, I, I don't know. We, um, my wife and I, um, spoiler alert, um, but we, um, we refer to that time as the fog because it just felt like you couldn't even see clearly. Um, and so uh, finally I, well, my wife had a moment. Um, she also worked at that church. She worked in the creative department and she had a moment where she was like, this is not right. I'm not doing this anymore. Like in a blaze of glory, like quit her job, like stormed out. And I was like, oh, wow, you can just do that? Like what? Um, but I just still was like, I was like gripping the side of the closet is what it felt like as she was like, come on, you know? And I was like, but security, comfort, like what will people think? Um, you know, I have very, uh, you know, like I said, very religious, everything, parents, friends, family. And so she, she left and sort of what just kept being like, Hey, there's a whole world out here. There's a whole world out here where no one cares. <laughs> and, and I'm like, that can't be real. That can't be true. Like, I don't know. I don't know what told me about this world. Um, and so I remember one night I was in my apartment and, and I was staring at this. Uh, so on the, the civil rights tour, as I mentioned one year, um, our interview that we had was um, John Lewis, um, who has just recently passed. And so we were in Selma, Alabama, and they were selling posters of, of him marching across the bridge and we bought him. And then when we got to DC for our final interview and interviewed him, um, you know, there's a group of 10 of us and he was so kind and generous with his time. And at the end we asked him like, like Congressman, like, would you sign these posters we got? And he did um because he was an angel and so i have that framed and it's like my most prized possession and so one night i was looking at it and i was just looking at it and i was alone in my apartment and i don't know i just kept looking at it and i was like how did you do that like how did you how did you just do that how did you know how did you how did you know that that was right and you were able to risk everything for it like what what is that about you, you know? Um, and I sort of like had a moment of like looking in the mirror, looking back at John Lewis, like looking in the mirror, looking back at John Lewis and being like, man, I have that. Like, I, I have that, I can do that. Like you, that's, that's a part of me. Um, and, and sort of just had this moment and I was like, no, I can do this. Like I can do anything. I can stand up for anything I believe is right. And it can cost me and that, that just has to be okay. Um, and so the next morning I went in, um, quit my job and told them what I thought <laughs> and, um, and left and, and everything after that was still a little blurry and hazy, but just better. Um, and Sammy and I, we came out, we got married, um, but the but the the journey between there and even after 
you know, coming out and thinking like, okay, I, I did it. I made it. I like did the thing. I like quit my job. Um, it continued to be hard. You know, we had some of our best friends in the entire world say they didn't want to stand with us in our wedding. You know, um, we had family members say, we love you, but you know, we can't, we can't support this. We had, you know, just hard thing after hard thing. And, and it, it just has been the biggest lesson in my life. Kind of what I was saying earlier, this is where it comes from of, man, it, it, you have to do the right thing. You have to do the thing you know is true and good. And that's not going to make it easy. That, and everything that I was afraid of, why I didn't want to leave my job, why I didn't want to lose my community. I was afraid that people would look at me differently, that they would say mean things to me, that I would lose friendships, that my parents would lose friendships, that people would lose jobs, like everything I was afraid of actually happened. Um, and, and I'm still okay. And they're still okay. Um, and, it, and it was still the right thing to do. And so coming out of that and, and sort of, you know, healing from the shock of it all was sort of the moment where I kind of realized I'm not the only one stuck in a, a loop of of do I do what I know is right and good and true and pure for me? Or do I acquiesce that part of my life for someone else's expectations? Um, there's a quote in the book. Um, and I always say that this is, this is the quote. Um, this is the question I asked myself uh, that night in the mirror um, that I continue to ask myself that sort of continues to drive my work. And it's, um, is my life a, re a reflection of who I want to be or is it a reaction to people I don't want to upset? Um, and looking in the mirror that night, I thought, oh man, <laughs> dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong answer, Beans. Um, everyone calls me Beans, including myself, apparently. Um, and so... Yeah, so here here we are now, and and what's so funny, I was just telling a friend this the other day, is um, someone asked me what was it like, you know, before the book came out, and I was saying <laughs> I was in therapy, and um, and I was saying I'm just kind of nervous, like wondering what people are going to think about the book, um, and you know, my therapist said, okay, that sounds familiar. Like, are you saying you're worried about what people are going to think? And I was like, no, but. I thought I already got over that. I thought I was done. I thought I fixed that when I did it one time. Um, and so just the reality of like, oh, this is something we just continue to do. And we're reminded of again and again of like, you, you have to ask yourself those hard questions and be willing to face hard truths and, and take losses. Um, and, and that's all a part of, of living. I say all the time, being human is the hardest job any of us will ever have. Um, and so if it's going to be hard, you might as well do the hard thing that, that you want. Yeah. 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 If anybody's interested, I, um, Britt has a book study like packet on her website that you can go to that. I mean, I don't know that you even really need a book study. And mm -hmm. I read some of through like a few of the pages and I was like, Oh, these are great questions. Like, I think my favorite one was imagine walking into a room, something like that. Like imagine walking into a room where you could be exactly who you are. What would that room, you know, look like or who would be in it? And I was like, yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. Just like even just, even just if you're in any sort of transition, which I think a lot of people are with the pandemic and whatever, you know, Right. Trying to imagine what your next step would be like, like, you know, just physically picturing what does that room look like? I know. I mean, obviously no one, I didn't write the book thinking like, well, 2020, you know, it's going to be a lot of changes for people. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, if, if there is one thing, I think everyone has been given more time perhaps than they had before to sort of evaluate like, what's priority? Um, how did that become a priority? Is that what I want to be priority in my life? Yeah. Um, and, and having the space to, to even ask ourselves those questions is uh, kind of a new thing, right? For, for some mm -hmm. of us, so. 
What a great year to have a self-help book coming out. <laughs> I know, seriously, did not plan it. <laughs> I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Let's all just get in a room and ask ourselves hard questions. <laughs> You've got the time. <laughs> yeah, let's all think deeply about our future. I don't know. Yeah. I try not to think too deeply about it right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's good. I've been watching a lot of just nonsense, <laughs> nonsense on TV, but would not recommend that as a coping strategy. Just <laughs> maybe a cautionary tale. What, the nonsense TV or thinking deeply about your future? Um, maybe <laughs> both, yeah. <laughs> Probably just stay away from home. Find somewhere in the middle. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, anybody else have any questions for Beans? She's our friend now. So. Yeah. But I, I'd like to know more about your church and how you founded it and just something about it. Oh, yes. Um, so uh, not soon after I left the, the mega church and I had come out and I was working at like a, a college in, in my, in, in Southern California. I got a message on Facebook from this guy named Corey and it just said like, Hey, I used to be a pastor to make a church. Like it's weird leaving. Do you want to get coffee? And I was like, what a weird, sure. Also, I'm in no place to pass up friends um, at this point in my life. And so I got coffee with this guy who, I mean, we, we joke all the time. He's, he's a tall, straight white guy. He looks like the, um, a Coors commercial is what I say all the time. And, and we sat down for coffee and again, like having, thinking we would have nothing in common. He told me about his role of becoming a mega church pastor and then just beginning to ask hard questions and those le leading him out of that role um, and wanting something different. And so um, together we co-pastor a church called New Abbey um, in, in Pasadena, California, now just on the internet, like everything else. Um, and it is such a delightful, quirky um, space. So my, some of my favorite things about it, um, we always say we only have, our mission statement is, is the same. It's telling the biggest story of God in Los Angeles in 2019, 2020, 2021. Um, and sort of this, you know, when I left, I thought like, this is the end of me being a Christian. This is the end of me going to church. This is the end of me being a pastor and sort of just throwing all of those things away because they felt so hurtful. Um, and, I, and I write about this in the last chapter of my book. So much of my own healing actually came from reclaiming those things um, and, and realizing uh, that the story was always meant to get bigger. Like this, the story of God, the stories that we see in, in the Bible, the narrative of the life of Jesus, like this, this makes sense. This, it's a, you know, a commentary on power and, and that makes so much sense for right now. And it's, I mean, so we, we got the opportunity every single week to have conversations and most of our church um, was people who had been in the evangelical church um, and and it's, it's amazing and it's so fun and um, so inclusive. And our children's pastor um, is trans and that opened up amazing conversations with the kids and our like music, like it's just so, it's so wonderful and um, in such an amazing community. So um, yeah, that's, I mean, one of the great honors of my life, I'll always say, is being a pastor in New Abbey um, and, and getting to, to expand the narrative. And, uh, you know, whenever folks ask me about my faith now or what's my spiritual, I just say it's 100% less fragile. Like, it's just, it's just big. Like, I used to feel like, oh, if I look behind this curtain or under this rock, it might tell me God doesn't exist. Like, I need to, but now I'm like, yeah, why can't be God be in the smoke from that feather? I, you know, I, anything you want, like it's, you, you, there's nowhere I can go to outpace that. And, um, getting to share that every Sunday w with the community was, was fantastic. So, uh, it's new Abbey church. If anyone wants to check it out. Where is it? <laughs> um, it's in, it's in Pasadena, California. 
Oh. Um, but they're current. Okay. We're currently live streaming because um, we're not gathering like in person, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so everything's live streamed. So um, if you go to like newabby, um, dot org, then you could just jump in any week. Yeah, this might be redundant. I might have missed this, but is that where you're from? Did you grow up in California? Or did you go to college in California? I might have missed some of that. Yeah, I went. So I grew up in uh, Colorado. Oh, Colorado. Um, Aurora, Colorado, little suburb outside of Denver. And then, I've yeah, been I went there. To, you've been there? I've been to Aurora, yeah. What are the odds? It was a <laughs> place. I like it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then I went to college in California, never left. I was there for 15 ish more years. And then two weeks ago, my wife and I moved to Austin. So. Oh, wow. Big move. I know. <laughs> Who are we? <laughs> <laughs> Where it's at, though, in Austin, right? It's amazing. Oh, uh, I mean, everything's shut down, but we still love it. So we're like, it, it, it's only going to get better. <laughs> yeah. well, that's great. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Thank you, Linda. That was a great question and a fantastic answer. I I forgot about that story about Corey and I loved that story in the yeah. book that, you know, you don't have to be, your identity doesn't have to be something that conflicts with the teaching of the church to, in order to question it and decide that you don't agree with it, which is, you know, just it's a beautiful thing to see a like a handsome straight white man make a great decision like that i know i love i love that guy he's we we joke we got coffee that one week um and we've literally talked every single week since so he's 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 a great dude I'm, am i frozen you are frozen, but in a cool Sorry. position. Oh, yeah. Of course, my dog is now making the decision to play with his toys, but <laughs> naturally. Anybody else have any questions? Can I borrow your copy of the book? Yeah. <laughs> I want to read it now. You can borrow mine. <laughs> Who said that? Brit? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll borrow yours. Just like... How far away are we from being able to like beam something through? Yes. I'm not doing anything this week. I'll just drive down. Um, <laughs> Get to Austin? Okay, good. I'll go with you. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to buy it, you can go to indiereads.org slash shop. You can buy stuff from us right now, right there. I don't know. There's a couple of people I don't know. So I'm just going to say something about Indie Reads while we're here. We are a nonprofit bookstore that does adult literacy work in Indianapolis. Um, all the proceeds from the bookstore go either to, you know, our small expenses and our employees like me and Debbie <laughs> or <laughs> to teaching adults for free all over the city. Um, to read, to read better, to get a high school equivalency, to learn English if it's not their first language. Um, right now we are in between physical stores. We moved out of one store and the second store is not yet ready. So that's a bummer. So now we're bookstore employees with no bookstore, but it'll happen. So that's all I have to say about Indie Reads. Uh, stay tuned for when we get to open up again. All right. And Anything else I want to say, Brett? Yeah. Thank you so much for coming to our little shop to talk. We really appreciate it. No, thank you so much yeah. for having me. Thank you for the work you do, um, mm -hmm. promoting literacy and great books, and just yeah, a love of a love a local bookstore. So yeah. um, it was it was an honor to be with you all tonight. Thank you thank so you. much. Yeah. Uh, have a great night, everybody. I will be sending out this recording and come in October to see this woman, Denise Testa, talk about the women that uh, were involved in the Dillinger case. It's going to be super interesting. She's like a, she's a real feminist. So who doesn't love that? Some people. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Yeah, so Bye. People. <laughs> Not our people. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Dave.
See you later. I miss you all. Mm. Missy.